This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice in it. And the first person I want to greet is my beautiful wife in San Francisco, California. Well, hello to everyone and greetings to my beautiful, gorgeous, most lovely husband in Barcelona. You, I miss you, my darling, but I tell you, you're just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that salvation does make us beautiful. So we can be male or female and we can be beautiful. Isn't that wonderful? So am I blushing right now? Uh, yes, you are. Now, Pastor, I'm going to ask for a little bit of privilege here. And one of the reasons that, you know, what a beautiful prayer time we had. It was just beautiful. And the Lord gave Terry a word that says that the Lord said it's a sweet smell, a sweet aroma that went up before God. And I just really received that and was blessed. And, you know, we need to keep reminding ourselves of the blessings of God and tell that, for instance, on last year, we did the cross out event, and I know many people are still believing God for their miracles. However, you know what? We have to believe that we received it and that God has answered it. And so I'm just going to say thank God for giving everyone the answer to their prayers. Now, I want you to know this, and then I'm going to uh, give the mic up. You know the story about my son, and it was right at the onset of the uh, cross-out event. And my uh, dear friend, Paula, she said to me, you know, praise God, God just used, you know, God did not give my son the COVID, but God, you know, what the Bible says, what Satan meant for harm, God always turns for good for his children. And God used that as a, a right there in the onset of the COVID, I mean, of the cross out, that this miracle. Now, listen, if God did it for Pastor Loretta Huggins, he's no respecter of person. You need to hold on to what you nailed to the cross and expect manifestation this year. And just, you know, I, uh, Dr. Summerall is, was uh, my husband's mentor, and he would say to God, you don't think I'm going to do without this. You don't think I'm going to live without this. I put this before you. And you know what? You're just going to have to say, God, you don't think I'm not going to have this manifestation so I want to encourage you all to not forget what you did and keep it before God. And the word of God says that the blood of Jesus is forever before God. Throughout eternity, the blood of Jesus is always before him. So hold on to that. Thank you, Pastor, for this moment. You are Praise very welcome. Lord. And uh, Pastor Loretta, you know that anytime you have a word or something to say, you just interject it. And... Uh, I say that to the Z team as well. We are a spirit-filled church. And uh, if you have a word from the Lord, find a good place in the service to get our attention and to get it, we'll, we'll recognize you and call on you. And uh, I encourage that. I want people to be able to obey God. We are a spirit-filled, Bible-believing, word-based, Holy Ghost church, an international church. We are having church at the speed of life. And this year, uh, we here's what I got in my spirit, and I shared it with the team, and, and I believe this has caught on with everyone, is we're pursuing the good life. Jesus came for us to have life and to have it super abundantly, to have the good life. And we want to go after what God has for us, a life of salvation, of healing, of prosperity, of family, of friends, of peace. And so uh, we are really pursuing the good life this year, and we're inviting everybody to join with us as we pursue the good life. Listen, let's get started. We've got a great message for you. It's called uh, Less is More, 
and we're going to have a good time with it, and we'll maybe have a little discussion afterwards, but right now I want to bless you, so lift your hands up and let me bless you. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for blessing our amazing Z team so that they will be filled with the Spirit and hear from the Spirit and obey the Spirit, and that they may receive something tangible out of this uh, message today that it'll affect, it will affect their lives, and they'll, they'll be able to get to that dream that we're talking about of living the good life. This is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, let's, let's say this together, and you can unmute mute yourself there and say, uh, we are one in the Spirit. We are, we are one, one in the Spirit. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are, we are one, one in, the, in Lord. the Lord. We are many members of the body of the Lord. We are, we are many, many members, members of the body, of the, body of, the of the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Lord. When one is helped, everybody's helped. When one is helped, everybody's helped. everybody's helped. When one is blessed, we're all blessed. When one is, when one is blessed, blessed, we're all blessed. all blessed. Because we're one in the Spirit. Because, because we're, we're one, one in the Spirit. Let's give him one big hand clap. Praise Praise God. God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Um, Paul, you've heard me say this before, but this is one of the things that the Lord showed me when he instructed me to start having church online. And for those of you who don't know this, we didn't start Z Church because of the pandemic. In October of the previous year, which would have been uh, 2019, my wife and I were praying. We got a word from the Lord to, to go online. Actually, we got a word a little bit sooner than that, but uh, it was about October to go online, start having church online. And we purposed to, to uh, start right after the first of the year. Well, guess what happened? Uh, the pandemic happened. I was in the United States uh, itinerating, going from church to church, and I cut my my ministry time in the U.S. right there, uh, cut it in half, really. I, I canceled two weeks' worth of meetings, got on the airplane and rushed back to Barcelona to be with my wife. And then, of course, after that, the doors closed and social distancing. And it was it was amazing because our timing was so good. And we give God the glory for that because he's the one that had us get ready for online church. And we didn't know how to do it, really. We just uh, we just started and we did the best we could. And, and uh, Robert Peck was the first one with me to me and Pastor Loretta to help us. And then people came on uh one by one, I believe it was divine appointments that God Pastor? brought together. Yes, it was divine appointment. Appointment. I I got your last meeting, and that's when you laid hands on me, and I fell out in the spirit. First time that's ever happened, and He prepared me for Z Church. Praise God. Him, I did not know that. That that blesses me. Praise God. Well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, so, let me see. Let's just get into the message here, and and then uh, maybe a little bit later, we'll see if we have any praise reports or word from the Lord. If God gives you a word, maybe at the end of the service, uh, you'll have an opportunity to to give that. But let me share with you what I have. And Father, I'm going to ask you to bless me and. Put your words in my heart and in my mouth so that I can be a vessel of honor that you can use. And I give you all the glory for everything you're doing and the hearts and the lives of people everywhere. And thank you for our amazing Z team that makes this happen because we're working together to obey you and to bless your people. And, and we all have something to do and we all have a reward coming for doing what we can for you and your kingdom in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. 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 Don't, amen. Forget, don't forget, you can say amen. You can hit that space bar, unmute yourself and say amen or, or put up the little emoticons. Praise the um, Lord. I want to give you two scriptures, and that's basically it today. Two scriptures, but these are these are loaded with information. First Timothy 6.6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Gain. If you read the rest of that chapter, you'll know that that uh, Paul starts talking about we came into the world with nothing. We didn't bring anything in the world. Uh, 
with us when we came into the world. We're not going to take anything out of it. And of course, we know that it's all going to remain here on the earth when we leave to be with the Lord. And then he talked about uh, avarice and a warned against greed. And he said, people that have gotten greedy and avaricious have really brought trouble into their own hearts. They brought a lot of unnecessary pain. And so he prefaced that with this verse. And this verse is that godliness with contentment is great gain. And I've heard a lot of people share on this over the years, and they usually it usually ends up this way. Uh, just be happy with the little bit you have. That's it. Just be content with the little bit you have. But that really does not agree with Scripture because uh, the Scripture says that we should prosper. The Scripture says that we should have abundance. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he were very rich, he was very rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. Why? So that we, through his poverty, might be rich. God's will for your life is abundance. So is this saying that we should not believe for abundance? Actually, it's a key to receiving abundance. I like it in the Amplified Bible. Listen to this. It'll, it'll open it up for you. Godliness actually is a source of great gain when it's accompanied by contentment, which comes from a sense of inner confidence in the sufficiency of God. I, I think I ought to say that again. Praise, Praise God. God. Godliness actually is a source of great gain some translations say wealth. It's, it's a source of wealth. It's a source of prosperity. When it's accompanied with the contentment that comes from knowing that your sufficiency is in God. Praise God. Amen. A lot of people have lost their contentment, their discontent, and that discontentment is working against them, preventing them from receiving the blessings of God. They're striving too hard. They're in too much of a hurry. They're not listening to God. They're ahead of God. Uh, they're just trying random things, but godliness with contentment is the source of great gain. Let me give you that word in the Greek. The word contentment is uh, I'm, I'm not so good at, uh, at pronouncing Greek words, so just pretend I know what I'm talking about. Autokia. Sounds like an automobile from Korea, doesn't it? Autokia. And it, it's only in two scriptures in the Bible. We only see this word two times. One time in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, godliness with contentment is the source of great gain. And then in 2 Corinthians 9.8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound into every good work. That's that same word, autokia. Sufficiency, contentment, brings sufficiency. We need to have confidence in God's ability to give us everything we need. We need to trust him as our source and as our supply, every good gift and every perfect gift descends from the Father of lights in whom is no variation or shadow of turning. He gives us the power to get wealth. Amen? He, 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 he gives us wealth without any sorrow, without any uh, toil and hardship and striving. It, we just relax and receive the blessings of God. This scripture is not telling us that we're supposed to just be you know, just be happy with the little bit that we have. No, it's saying, be happy in the knowledge that you're blessed. Be content Amen. in the knowledge that God will perform what he said he would. In other words, relax and let God be God. Amen. It's, really, it's really about faith, godliness with contentment. We don't have to worry. God's going to take care of us. We don't have to beg him because he's the one who already purposed to bless us. It's his idea. If you go all the way back to his original intent when he created Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden that he created, that he planted, and he put everything in that environment that they needed to live and to prosper and to want nothing. And that was his intention for them to be taken care of and live in security forever. And that hasn't changed. His purposes haven't changed. What Praise we forfeited, 
What we forfeited through Adam's sin, we have regained through Jesus' obedience. Amen. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Amen. Christ, though he were rich, yet for our sakes he became poor at the cross so that we through his poverty might be rich. Praise God. You can't argue with that. Prosperity is in the atonement. Healing is in the atonement and salvation Amen. is in the atonement. The curse was threefold. It was spiritual death, sickness, and poverty. Poverty is a curse. God wants you to be blessed. And he says, here's all you have to do. Just be content in me and watch me work. Just sit back and relax and watch me fulfill my promises. You know, this Praise thing the about, uh, about uh, the internet, there's no distance in, in uh we say there's no distance in the spirit and there is absolutely no distance in the spirit. But the internet uh, reaches around the world to most of the habitable world anyway, and it happens very quickly. It doesn't happen instantaneously, but it happens very quickly. And so it's, it's as though that even though we're in different places right now, we're still together online. And my wife and I, you know, we have virtual church. My wife and I right now are having a, a virtual marriage because she's in the United States about 9,000 miles away from where I am. And I don't feel the distance, but the challenge is the time because we have nine hours difference between her time and my time. It's in the morning where she is, probably in the morning where you are. It's in the evening where I am. And that takes a little bit of adjustment. Now, the reason I brought that up is with God, timing is everything. And how many of you have found out that his timing and your timing don't always coincide, but God's timing is always the best timing. Amen. He does the right thing at the right time. And I believe that, that where we get frustrated is, is, you know, we want things to happen in our time scheme. And, uh, well, I'll just speak for myself. You know, there's a lot of times I think God has blown the deadline here. You know, you should have done this yesterday. Oy vey, what's going on here, you know? But uh, I, have to, I have to believe that timing is everything with God, and there's a reason. So if you don't get an answer, it doesn't mean that God has denied you what you've asked for, it means that God has scheduled that blessing at, a, at an important time in your life. And that's where being content comes in, where we don't get ahead of God and we, we're not aggravated with God and we don't find fault with God. And we're not shaking our fist at him saying, what's the matter with you? You know, let's get with this thing is just, is just chill out, right? Take a chill pill and say, God, Praise the uh, Lord. I know you hear me when I pray. I know I have the answer to what I prayed for. I know that you fulfill your promises. So I'm just going to quiet myself like a child. David said this, King David, like a child that's weaned from his mother. You know, the weaning of a child is, is, a, is a pretty nerve wracking thing for that child. He's going through withdrawal. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we just have to wean those children off the breast so that they can start uh, enjoying, you know, a different kind of food and eventually adult food. And some of us are being weaned and we don't like it. Uh, you know, I I'm sorry. We just like, uh, we like sitting in God's lap and having that comfort and be able to, you know, to just uh, take sustenance from him and uh, all cozied up, and that's good. But then when we, when we don't get our way, we get a little aggravated, don't we? we get, a little, Amen. get a little aggravated. So we, I think that's what the Apostle Paul was talking about here, is this dissatisfaction is what's preventing the, the answer from coming. You see how I flipped that around? Godliness with contentment is the source of great gain, but discontentment is the source of lack. Praise Can you God. Wow. That? Pastor. That is powerful. That, that's, that's, we ought to say that again, don't you think? Yes. Yes. Praise yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> if godliness with contentment is the source of great gain, then discontentment is the reason for lack. Wow. 
it's two sides of the same Amen. coin. So we need to we need to deal with the discontentment. We have to we have to believe this. There's no fault with God. God is never at fault. Pastor. And whether we understand it or don't understand it, we have to believe that God is never at fault. My uh, old spiritual mom, uh, my my dear friend Doyle Tucker's mother, Mother Tucker in Tulsa, uh, she talked like an Oki because she was from Oklahoma, and she'll say, a God don't miss it. We're the ones what miss it. <laughs> <laughs> and that may not be good grammar, but it's good theology. God doesn't miss it. We're the ones who miss it. The problem is never on God's side of the equation. So this thing about sufficiency is very important. Here's, here's a biblical definition of success. I'll give it to you again. It's what we read in 2 Corinthians 9.8. God is able to make all grace abound to you. Remember the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he were rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might be rich. That's the grace that, that Paul's talking about here. The context is prosperity, and Paul is saying this grace to prosper is abounding toward you to, to the extent with the result that you will always have all sufficiency in all things and be able to abound in every good work. Always have all sufficiency in all things. In other words, everything that you need to live the good life. You will not lack anything. Plus, you'll have plenty left over to contribute to other people's welfare, to give to the church, to give to missions, to sow into good projects, uh, to lend a helping hand, you'll have not just your basic needs met and what you what you want met, but God will give you seed to the sower so that you can multiply that seed and have even more. It's dynamic. If we will take a part of his blessings and re-sow it, which is a biblical principle, tithing is 10% off of what we've received. However, God has prospered us. We take the first tenth and we return it to God. And then on top of that, we give offerings. A tithe is not an offering and an offering is not a tithe. Offerings don't kick in until we tithe. You know, in Malachi, God said, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. And so we need to tithe and we need to give offerings. And some people say, I Amen. give my tithe here, I give my tithe there. You need to fix your vocabulary. You return your tithe unto God. Now, he may have someone that he has appointed in your life to be the steward, to receive, to be the priest and receive your tithe, but you're actually returning the tithe to God. Praise the Lord. So it's his. The earth and the fullness there belong to him. So Amen. you established his authority and his position in your life as the source by returning the tithe. And you've, you've actually acknowledged that blessing and that covenant by returning the tithe. It puts you in a position to receive. And God says, go ahead and tithe, but that isn't enough. Bring me an offering too. Now, you don't have to pray about your tithe because it's 10%. No matter how much you pray, it's still going to be 10% because 10% is 10%. There's no such thing as tithing 1% or 5% or even 11%. It's 10%, exactly, precisely. Now, whatever you do above that 10% is now automatically an offering, and that's why you need to pray in the Spirit and ask God where to plant your offering. You need to be led of the Spirit. And you need to do it from your heart as a man purpose in his heart. Let him give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And Amen. so here we have it, that God's plan for you is to have sufficiency. That means all of your needs and everything that you desire to live that good life, that life of abundance, and on top of that, plenty left over. Everybody say plenty left over. Plenty, plenty left, left over. over. Well, how do you get to that place? How do you get to that place of plenty left over? Is, is becoming content in God, learning how to rest in God. There's a scripture. I, I didn't know if I was going to share this, but I think I will. Ecclesiastes 4.6. Better is a handful with quietness 
than both hands full with travail and vexation of the spirit. Some translations say, uh, better is a handful when you're relaxed than both hands full when you're not relaxed and you're trying to fight the wind. So uh, if, you think about, if you think about this, less really is more. Less worrying produces more blessings in your life. Less striving produces better results. Remember Jesus said every tree and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it so that it'll bear more fruit. He said branches that don't bear fruit, he takes them away and burns them. But when a branch is bearing fruit, he prunes it or trims it on a regular basis so that it will keep bearing fruit. You know, every time you tie, Amen. it's like your, your fruit tree being trimmed. Every time you give an offering, it's like your fruit tree being trimmed. But if you've ever been involved in, in any kind of agriculture or fruit production of any sort, you know that that's true, is that you have to skillfully know how to prune, when and how to prune, and it actually causes more production. They do that in vineyards. They do that in orchards. They do it uh, all around the world. It's, uh, it's uh, not a secret. It's a principle that a tree that's productive becomes more productive if the husbandman is allowed to skillfully prune that tree. And so sometimes when we're giving, we're thinking something is leaving our life and we're, we're having lack. No, when you plant a seed, give a seed to God, it never leaves your life. It just goes into your future and prepares a harvest. So instead of waving goodbye to your seed, wave hello to your harvest. Praise God, because Amen. the seed produces a harvest. So remember, think about the harvest. When a farmer plants a seed, he's thinking about the harvest. He doesn't go out there with a bag full of corn seed and say, oh my God, I just, I just can't let go of this seed. Look how shiny and pretty it is. It's all yellow. And now I got to put it in the dirt and I just can't bring myself to do it. I'm going to keep this seed for myself. If I'm going to take it home and eat it. You see, farmers don't think that way. If they thought that way, they would starve to death. If all the farmers thought that way, the whole world would starve to death. They cheerfully plant their seed because they're expecting a harvest. You don't get back one seed for every seed you plant. You get back hundredfold seed for every seed you plant. Amen. Praise God. So you have to think about that harvest. Less is more Amazing. for every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, he cuts it back a little so that it'll produce more fruit. You know, we need, to, uh, we need to think about the good life and what that really means. Uh, Dr. John Avanzini taught my wife and me a lesson that we never forgot. He said, we cannot judge another man's desires. And I, I, I really stopped and listened to him. And he said, everyone has a different desire. And then he went on to say, God has desires. He understands desires. Um, God desired a family. That's why he sent Jesus to redeem us, because he desired a family. Amen. It's not, it's not as though that uh, he couldn't do things without us. He wanted us. He desired us. And people may judge you because of the things that you, uh, that you have. You don't need that big car. No, I don't need it. I desire it. That's too much house for you. You don't have, need to live in a house that large. You're right. I don't need to. I want to. It's Amen. a desire. Praise God. So uh, I, don't have, I don't have a right to tell you what you should desire. If it's, if it's wholesome and honest and re has a redemptive value, you go for it. If you want a jet airplane, you go for it. Someone came up to me and they said, Ambassador Huggins, I'm believing God that he's going to give you a citation jet. I said, while well, you're at it, believe God for the $1,500 an hour it takes to operate that citation jet. Amen. <laughs> I don't want a citation jet. You couldn't give me one. I mean, if you did, I'd flip it real quick. I'd go sell it to one of these evangelists who think they need it. Uh, and I'll take all that money and spend it on something else. I don't need a citation jet. I've flown around the world many, many times. And uh, I've always gotten to where I was going. And I always got there in a timely fashion. 
and they take care of you and give you peanuts and all that stuff on the airplane. So uh, I don't have any complaints there. I've had a couple of airplanes and, uh, uh, you know, the, it's kind of like a boat. They say that there are two best days for boat owners, the day you get a boat and the day you get rid of the boat. And it's sort of like that with airplanes, you know, it's, you're, you're real excited when you get one and then you're really relieved when you let go of it. Uh, Dr. Harrison and I started Faith Christian Fellowship and, and it started to produce uh, uh, a lot of revenue very quickly. Of course, we had thousands of people in hundreds of churches and uh, we felt like, I didn't, but my boss felt like we needed an airplane. And so he got a Aero Commander, Jet Commander 680A, turbo twin turbo prop, eight passengers, pressurized, go all the way up to 22,000 feet, get you there quick and in comfort. And so we bought this airplane. And uh, I took it on one trip. I took it uh, to Mark Hankins Church in, in uh, Mississippi. And uh, I took my son with me just, you know, so I'd have someone to, uh, fill one of the seats there. It's kind of silly having an airplane that big and only one seat filled. And so I had a good time at Mark's and came back home. And And uh, as a member of the staff, I had to pay my part for the for the operation of the airplane. I had to pay my part. And um, as it turns out, my part was about 10 times higher than it would have been if I had flown commercially. Well, I didn't fly the airplane anymore. And uh, Dr. Harrison got irritated with me. He said, why aren't you taking that airplane on your trips? I said, because I like to bring an offering home. <laughs> I don't want to put all my money in this stupid airplane. And <laughs> uh, he, he finally got the same revelation. And we sold it shortly thereafter. Less is more. Praise God. Hallelujah. We, we can live without an airplane. Now, Dr. Summerall absolutely needed one because of his schedule and uh, all of his books that he took and all of his staff that he took. And uh, he needed an aviation ministry. Some ministries need an aviation ministry. Others just want it. So I'm not here to judge what they want or what they desire. But speaking for me, when it came to an airplane, less is more. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. You know, there are a lot of simple things in life that don't cost any money at all. You know, just uh, just just looking at the beautiful things that are around it. Um, I miss having my prayer walks with Pastor Loretta since she's been in the USA, but I continue to do it. I continue to do the prayer walks. Today I did I did seven kilometers. That's four point four statute miles. Praise God, not bad, huh? And it's a good prayer. It's a lot. And uh, I know a lot of people, I've been criticized. People on Facebook say, well, you don't have any faith because every time I see you in a picture, you're wearing a mask. Well, actually, I'm doing what uh, what the law says. You know, I'm, I'm trying to protect myself and other people. I don't have any problem with that. And I said, well, look at it this way. It's a prayer mask. And I can pray in tongues walking down the street. And nobody even knows what I'm doing. And I, say, Amen. I wear my prayer mask. And when I'm walking down this, when Pastor Loretta and I are walking down the street, we're going, Shandala Boshupuriyama Boshuparatabon Ekalamaha. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. And, and so what does it cost to go for a walk? Nothing. What does it cost to watch a sunset? Nothing. What does it cost to you know, uh, to plant a garden, very little. What does it cost to have a hobby? Not much, unless your hobby is collecting expensive cars or something like that. I'm a painter. I love to paint. It's more than a hobby. It really is. It's It stopped being a hobby a long, long time ago. But I, uh, one of the reasons I think that uh, people respond very well to my art is I have a secret. I pray in the spirit while I paint. Praise God. Simple Amen. things. I'm talking about. I'm talking about a simple life. Uh, my wife and I love getting up in the morning, and we have our our devotional time, our prayer time, and coffee. Mm -hmm. It's biblical. He brews. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and so he brews us a couple of cups of coffee, and we sit there, and that's that little morning ritual of having a warm cup of coffee. 
it's not, you don't have to spend a lot of money to have a, a, a nice cup of coffee. My wife laughs at me because uh, I don't do it so much anymore, but I used to have the big espresso machine in the grinder, even roasted my own coffee. I, I would have willingly gone to Jamaica to pick the Blue Mountain coffee beans if I, if I could have, but I was into it. I was buying beans online and roasting them and uh, grinding them and tamping them down and getting my machine all adjusted and making a coffee. And I would come in and I would show it to her and I would say another perfect Americano. This is true. <laughs> Thank you for admitting that. Simple things, simple things. It would be a shame for us to get so what narrow-minded with such a narrow vision that we stop paying attention to the good things that are around us. My wife and I take a lot of pleasure in, in family and friends. And uh, my wife is the hostess with the mostess and everybody uh, just raves about uh, Pastor Loretta, the way she serves and entertains and she's a hostess and, and people say, here, let me help you with this and that. She says, I'm here to serve you. You go sit down and enjoy. And she just goes all out. And she loves doing that. She loves just, you know, making people comfortable and entertaining them and feeding them. And uh, those, are, those are some of the simple pleasures that we get out of life. Amen. Uh, money won't buy you friends. If you have friends that, uh, you know, money has bought, they're not really your friends. I have to say Amen. something about the Spanish culture here is they're not very class conscious. Uh, you'll see people that are uber rich and they have friends that just, uh, you know, common working people, but uh, they'll tell you this, our friends are our friends and they don't choose their friends because they have money or don't have money. Uh, in our case, we, we know people from the upper echelons all the way down and we love them all. And I believe that's the way Jesus was. Now, before I close here, let me ask you three important questions. Do you think that Jesus was covetous? Do you think he, he, he was ever envious about something someone had? No. Do you think he ever looked at someone and said, man, I wish I had that coat. That's a pretty cool coat. That coat would look good on me. I'm going to see if I can't use my influence there and talk them out of that coat. <laughs> you know, back in the early Word of Faith days, this happened all the time. Someone wanted to say, uh, brother, I'm believing for a car exactly like yours. Is God talking to you? <laughs> Covetousness. You know, Amen. I'm believing, I'm believing God for uh, a suit just like one you're wearing. Is God talking to you? Covetousness. <laughs> Do you think Jesus was covet, covetous? Do you think he ever saw something anybody had and, and pined away about it, felt jealous over it? No, of course not. Do you think Jesus was, was ever uh, insecure about his security? That's kind of redundant, isn't it? Insecure about his insecurity. Do you think he was ever insecure? What am I going to do? I mean, what's going to happen? Am I going to have enough? Uh, I need more. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to build a bigger barn and put some stuff. Never. In. Got to lay it up for you know. Do you think Jesus ever thought that way? No. And 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 uh, uh, the third question: Do you think he ever had a lack? Do you ever think he lacked anything? No. Oh. He didn't covet anything. He wasn't insecure about not having something. And he was quite confident that he would always have what he needed when he needed it because his, he knew his heavenly father would provide it for him. Amen. And that's what I'm saying. You know, Jesus had time to smell the, the roses, so to speak. He had the time to uh, pick the fruit off the trees. He had the time to 
dine with his with his friends. You know, they accused him of being a glutton and a wine bever because he liked hanging out at restaurants and and, and going to weddings and and uh, being social and having meals. He liked that. He liked being with his friends and and staying with Lazarus and Mary and Martha and, and hanging out with people. He really enjoyed the people around him. And he liked to eat. We know that in the Bible. He liked to wear nice clothes. Uh, yeah, other people wanted his clothes because he wore some nice clothes. And uh, he liked going up in the mountains. He liked, uh, he liked the time he had with his father. He liked being out on the sea. He liked being on the Mount of Olives. Uh, he enjoyed things. Uh, and, you know, when he's on the boat, he's asleep on the, on the boat, even though there's a storm, because he was the personification of relaxation. You ready for the you ready for the deep part of this message? Amen. Go yes. Yes. Yeah. I hear a prophecy. Thus saith the Lord. Relax. Praise, Praise the God. Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Take a chill pill. Yeah. Relax. He's going to take care of you. You won't have to worry. You won't have to want because God is going to give you everything that you need and desire. In his time, this is true. God has good things in store for you. So pray and believe and receive by faith and just rest, knowing that God's going to come through for you and you will have the best. Amen. Name, amen. Praise God. Less is more. Less is more. Praise God. Spend less time getting caught up in uh, caught up in all the craziness that's around you. Spend less time um, being part of the online dialogue of all the hate and racism and criticism and, and all of that rhetoric. Spend less time. Spend less time worrying about that. And, and let me give you a word that's going to strike a little bit closer to home. Don't sweat the end time stuff. <laughs> Amen. Been, you know, every every few years, everybody says this is it. It's the end. The waters are turning red, and you know the uh, they have all these signs and everything. And you know, actually, the Bible says that uh, nobody knows the time when he's coming. Nobody does. And here's what the Bible tells us to do to get ready for him to come. Provide meat for your family in due season. Blessed is the man who's found so doing at the appearing of the Lord. Do you know how we prepare for the end times? Go to school. How do we prepare for the end times? Find a husband, find a wife, start a family. How do you prepare for the end times? Build a house. How do you prepare for the end times? Start a business. Hallelujah. Go, go skiing in the mountains. Uh, go to the beach. How do you prepare for the end times? Uh, live in the presence of God and, and, and walk with God and talk Amen. with God and relax in God and rest in God. And don't, don't let people get you whipped up into a frenzy because you'll be blind to the good things that are around you right now. You won't be able to see them. All you'll be Amen. able to see is trouble and problems and, and politicians and rhetoric and revolution and climate change and pandemics and everything. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Let's dial this back a little bit. The pandemic has not given me the blues one day. You can ask Amen. my wife about this. I have not lost any sleep over the pandemic. I have not belly ached. I prayed for people. I prayed for the end of it. Why shouldn't I? But uh, to just sit around and be upset, as some people are every day, about the pandemic and, oh, oh woe is me and all that stuff. Let me tell you something. I, I lost weight during the pandemic. Praise God. Look at this. Hey, man. Praise the Lord. I, I, looking good. Looking good. Yeah, I walked more during the pandemic. I, I started the internet church during the pandemic. I've made new friends during the pandemic. I've created paintings in the pandemic. I've studied Spanish in the pandemic. Praise God. I'm making the most out of it. If they give you lemons, make lemonade out of it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise hey, God. Man. I hope Pastor Larry's helping you a little bit. It's time for us to uh, 
to say amen to that. Father, there are so many people out there that I know who are, who are worried about their future and they don't, they don't know what's going to happen in the world. Uh, I have a strong message for them today, a message of comfort. Uh, if it, those of us who put our trust in God need not be afraid. We need not fear. And we need to put our trust in God. We need to build our lives on the rock of the revelation of Jesus. We need to trust your word and believe your promises. And those who trust you don't strive. The servant of God must not strive. We're supposed to be patient. And we're supposed to be polite and kind and thoughtful and generous and, and uh, reverential. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for blessing people just to have a supernatural rest. There is a rest for the people of God. This is the rest wherein you may cause the weary to rest. The praying in tongues is the rest that causes the weary to rest. And one of the most important things we'll ever do is pray in the Spirit. And this gift is for you and for your children and as many as far off as the Lord our God should call. So what do, you do, what do you do while you're waiting for your ship to come in? What do you do while you're waiting for that, that whatever it is you're waiting on, you know, the prosperity, a new house, uh, uh, whatever, airplane, what do you do? Uh, you rest. Well, does that mean do nothing? No, the rest of faith, which is praying in tongues. That's the best rest you'll enter into. If you've entered into the rest, you've ceased from your own labors. And here in this age of grace, we have ceased from our own labors. Back in the Old Testament, there was no rest for those people. They were just constantly tormented. They, 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 they had to do things every day to prove themselves worthy, and they weren't worthy, and it was a vicious cycle. But here in this New Testament, our righteousness in, is in Christ, and we just rest in that. Praise God. Man. And look at it this way. If, 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 he, if he can't take care of you, who can? Who are you going to go to? If, if, if God's not going to do it for you, who are you going to go to? Of course, oh, man. Of course, he's the be-all, do-all, end-all for everything we need. He's our source and our supply. So we're not, we're not looking for someone else. We're looking to God to do what he promised he would do, and he will do it. And in the meantime, we rest. Praise God. We enjoy life. You know, there's so many things that you can do as you pray in tongues. You can drive your car and pray in tongues. You can go for a walk and pray in tongues. You can be sitting on your, on your chair praying in tongues. Uh, you can be doing housework or mechanical work or whatever and pray in tongues. I, I pray in tongues when I paint. I mentioned that. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, do less worrying and more resting. Father, I do pray for Amen. everyone who's watching and listening today, and I pray that if they're troubled, they'll come to Jesus. And he, ha he, will, he will save them to the utmost if they trust in him. Praise God. I want Z Church to be a safe harbor, a safe port during a storm. There's a lot of storms going on in life right now. And when you come to Z Church, uh, we're not going to add any more stress to you. We're not going to give you more things to worry about, more things to be upset over. We're going to give you fewer things to worry about and fewer things to be upset over. Uh, and I'm in hopes that during the time you spend with us in Z Church, it's going to be a refresher for you. Uh, you're going to be in your place of refuge, your place of, of rest and healing and safety. You're safe here in Z Church. We're for you. We're not Praise against God. We're for you. And uh, you, can't, you can't mess up so bad that we don't love you. Uh, Jesus loved us when we were unlovable, and, and that's what we want. We want that same kind of uh, agape love to be here. If, if you're looking for truth and reality and salvation, why don't you pray this prayer with me? You're one prayer away from having a worry-free life. You won't ever worry about your, your future again. You won't ever worry about your eternal soul again. Just one prayer. Is that such a hard thing to do? 
If, if you need rest for your soul, would you close your eyes and raise your hands and pray this prayer with me and pray it aloud and, and say, Heavenly Father, I, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, I come, come to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Thank you for the gift of your son. Thank, Thank you for the gift of your son. Who gave himself for me. Who gave himself for me. So I can come back to you. So I can come back to you. And live in Father's house. And live in Father's house. And have Father's provision. And have Father's provision. Father's protection. Father's protection. And Father's love. And Father's love. Right now I receive Jesus. Right now I receive Jesus. And I put all my trust in him. And I put all of my trust in him. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise Amen. God. Praise Hallelujah. God. Amen. Pastor Loretta, do you have some comments or anything the Lord has shown you? Um, no, Pastor. I just wanted to just encourage everyone to embrace this. This is so very important. And you hit on the scripture, Pastor, that's very important about entering the rest. And that scripture in Hebrews that you reference, it says, today, you hear his voice, you know, harden not your heart and enter into that rest. There is this, yet this rest that remains today. Now, if you think about that, every single day of your life will be today. So the, the, the promise to enter into that rest is going to always be today. Amen. So if you haven't entered that rest in the past, today, live the good life. Today, pursue what God sent Jesus to die for you to have. Tomorrow, right now, may be tomorrow for us. But when we reach tomorrow, it's going to be today. And that promise that God has given to us to enter into the rest will always be valid will always be open, will always be forever because it's today. So I just want everyone to, to be encouraged that every single day of your life, God is saying, today, enter into my rest, today. There is no expiration on this promise of God. So all you have to do is enter into that rest. Thank you, Pastor. Well, Amen. thank you. Amen. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Elder Dustin, do you have a word from the Lord for us? Yeah. Um, well, it goes right along. Uh, do you want me to go right into the offering now? Because what I have to share goes well, right. Um, well, we could, but um, let's postpone the offering. Just share with us what you have on your heart, and then we'll tie it in again later. Okay. Well, it, it ties in. It has to do with the concept of sufficiency. And, uh, you know, you were talking about how contentment actually means sufficiency. And that same word appears in Philippians when Paul said, in whatever state I'm in, I'm content. I've learned to abase. I've learned to abound. And as you were saying, this doesn't mean that we resign ourselves to live in certain situations. Paul was saying, I'm sufficient in every situation. Yeah. So whether I'm in my uh, uh, apartment in Rome, which at that time would be the equivalent to a penthouse today, I had the sufficiency, and I look at it this way, to not become arrogant or think more of myself because of my riches. And when I'm in prison for preaching the gospel, I'm still sufficient, so I don't lose my self-esteem because I'm now in a prison. I have a constant sufficiency because my sufficiency is in Christ. And when the Bible even talks about riches and Jesus becoming poor so that we can become rich, uh, poverty had to do with money, but it also had to do with shame. It had to do with a lack of dignity. So when we think about Jesus becoming poor, he took all the insufficiency for in all things to make us again sufficient in all things. So I just, uh, that just the word sufficient just kept ringing out to me while you were preaching today that uh, we can feel sufficient in every situation. Thank you, Dustin. I, I knew you had a, a jewel there for us. Yeah, sufficiency is the word for today. Our sufficiency is in Christ. Our sufficiency is in God. Uh, Paul said, when I'm weak, I'm still strong. In other words, I've got, I've got sufficiency even at a low ebb of my life. I've still got more than enough to be a world overcomer. And uh, 
if we truly believe that, then we can enter into that rest. And we're not going to sweat the small stuff. It's going to work out. It's going to work out. Praise God. But we're pursuing uh, the good life this year. We're going after it. And I want you to have it. People have been sharing their, their dreams and goals with me. And they've all been great. I've read all of them. Uh, I'm in agreement with you. Uh, if, I, if I haven't responded, that doesn't mean I didn't read it. I'm reading it. And uh, I know that you're, you're believing God for the good life. And that means different things for, for different people. Well, here's one of the keys of, of receiving those goals and visions is don't be in strife. Don't be in stress. Just relax because you're blessed. Amen. I want to hear Amen. from somebody else. Maybe two more people. You have a, you, something uh, stood out to you in the service. You want to give an encouraging uh, exhortation here. Speak up. Pastor, I would like to just say that it always seems like God is going to be late. But God is always on time. But he always is last minute. Praise sometimes God. it seems that way. <laughs> uh, sometimes it does. I think that we mere mortals uh, have a different concept of time, especially in this age, because we're used to getting things quickly. You know, the microwave mentality. Uh, back in older days, agrarian times, people people knew how to. Well, uh, I'll give you an example. There's a there's a fable about an old man about 80 years old who's digging this big hole in Israel and he's digging through the rock. If, if you never had a chance to go to the Holy Land, go to Texas. We've got the same rocks, the same shrubs, the same weather, and it's hard to dig in the Texas ground, I know. And this guy is digging this big hole and someone passed by and said, what are you doing down there, old man? And he said, I'm planting an olive tree. Now you have to dig a hole and fill it up with dirt so there'll be something for the, you know, to, to keep the olive tree going. And this person laughed at him and said, old man, you'll be dead before this olive tree produces olives. He said, it's not for me. It's for my children. Praise the Lord. You know, a different concept of time. Okay, let's have, a, uh, let's have one more. Who's got a word for us? Pregnant pause there. Okay, uh, you don't have to say anything. But uh, if you have a if you have a praise report or something like that, we'd love for you to give it. Otherwise, we are going to go uh, right to the offering. And uh, from no, we're not. We're going to have communion. Then we're going to go to the offering. That's the way we're going to do it today. So let's have communion right now in Jesus' name. And uh, I have uh, prepared for communion. Pastor Loretta and I have had communion this way for years where I would be in one part of the world and should be in another and we'd do it by phone. Uh, back before we had live streaming, we'd do it by phone and, and you, got your, you got your juice, yeah, you got your bread, yeah, you got your Bible, yeah. We would have communion. And so uh, it, it works because we're communing. We're in fellowship. We're sharing. Uh, we're sharing the Lord's table together. We want to share it with you. So let's prepare our hearts. Father, we thank you for the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our, our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. And I thank you for the power that's in communion, the power to heal, the power to make whole, the power to bring harmony and peace. And I believe that this cup today is a cup of peace. It'll just bring peace to our souls and peace to our minds, peace to our hearts, because we're in the Lord and there's no covetousness in Jesus. There's no lack in Jesus. There's no insecurity in Jesus and we're in him. So we thank you that the relationship he has with his heavenly father we have the same relationship because we're in Christ. Let's partake of the body of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the cup of blessing. I don't know if, if 
I could say this too often, but if you'll understand it, this cup guarantees all the promises of God. It seals it. It's the covenant cup that represents the shed blood of Jesus that ratifies all the promises of God. Jesus said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. It's salvation, it's healing, and it's prosperity. Praise God. So as you partake of this, you are recognizing that God has promised in what he promised he will perform, and he backs it up with nothing less than the blood of the Lamb. When you drink this, I expect peace to wash over you. I expect calmness, tranquility to come into your soul. And I expect worry and anxiety in any form to lead, leave you. And I'm pretty sure the reason Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, is that he knew we would have challenges every day and be tempted to get out of that rest. But if you have to have communion two or three times a day, do whatever it takes to stay in the rest. Let's enter into the rest. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for this cup of blessings, and it ratifies all of the promises. They are all yes and amen. And what you promised, you will perform, guaranteed by this cup. Amen. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Amen and amen. Um, brother, Elder Dustin is going to, uh, he's going to lead us in our tithes and offerings. And feel free to make that connection that you were talking about there. And then someone's going to take us right out to the afterglow, I believe uh, Catherine is. So thank you, Dustin. Obey God. Amen. Amen. As we were saying, you know, God makes us sufficient in all things. And in 2 Corinthians 9, it talks about the grace of giving. So there's a grace, there's a favor and an ability upon being generous. And that in doing so, God makes us sufficient in all things, all material things. Because I believe that when you give, you're actually, it's a spiritual law, but at the same time, you're programming your natural mind to think like a person who is more of a giver than a consumer. Uh, Because in the kingdom of God, we are complete. We're in Christ. So we're not victims. We're not people who are looking uh, for something on the outside to make us something. We already are someone. And so when we give out of that reality, independent of what our natural circumstances are, we tap in to the power of sufficiency and abundance. So today, now I've already exhorted a fair bit on this, so I don't want to belabor the point, uh, but I want to encourage you today that this is how you experience the good life. This is one of the ways you experience the good life is that you tap into the grace of giving, that you sow in faith and that God makes his grace, his supernatural favor abound to you to experience sufficiency in all areas of your life. So right now we're going to give you the opportunity to give. You can do that. Uh, the information is coming up in, in the chat right now. You can do that through uh, zchurch.life. You can do monthly giving through the tithely if you want to set up monthly giving for your tithes and offerings. And you can also do text to give at 833-997-2102, or you can give through PayPal. So today we bless you as you give your tithes and offerings. We receive it as a church and we offer it up as a sweet smelling fragrance to the Lord.